The work of this team, which was organized by Father DeVoe, was originally supposed to be published as soon as possible and open to scholarly interpretation. John Allegro was the only member to publish all of his translations in the learned journals as soon as he felt they were ready to be laid open to scrutiny. The other members of the team tended to hold on to their allocations for so long that some people, including Allegro from time to time, suspected a cover-up and suppression of the research. In fact, Allegro was asked several times to hold back on some of his translations for several years or face retribution. He sometimes unwillingly complied. If not a cover-up, an unwillingness to tell all, all at once. There always was a feeling that if we go carefully, we can release the information in a way that need generate no hostility or over-questioning. But we will do. We will control it. By 1968, Allegro completed and published all of his translations of the Cave Four scroll fragments assigned to him. In the 15 years since the international team was put together in 1953, Allegro was the only member to finish his assigned duty. The remaining scrolls were not published until 1991, when the Huntington Library in San Marino, California finally released the photographs of all the scrolls to expedite their publication. The other members of the original team held on to most of their translations until after 1997, which was 29 years or more after Allegro, and 50 years or more since the original discovery of the scrolls in 1947. During this time, scholars who attempted to question the orthodox view, as Allegro found out, had their careers destroyed. There is much to learn about John Allegro. He was the only member who wasn't a committed Christian and considered himself agnostic. An agnostic is someone who doesn't believe in nor against any religious philosophy, and this placed Allegro at an unbiased advantage over the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls team. The other men, unlike Allegro, had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, that Jesus was a real man and that the scrolls in no way threatened the foundations of Christianity. Because of Allegro's differing ideas on the scrolls and his public statements about them, he was made the target of sharp and unjustified criticism by his teammates who attacked him in the press. And it seemed to me in the reference in that scroll to crucifixion that it brought us much closer to the Christian story, the myth of Jesus. And then when I published this, there was such an outburst, uproar, not least among my colleagues who were afraid of the fear that it would upset people that Jesus wasn't the first prophet to have been crucified or something. Uh, no more than that. The, 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 drink, the links between Jesus and the, the leader of the Essenes were much closer, or could have been much closer than it had been, that had been realized, that the uniqueness of the Christian story was a, a, a sort of risk, that they then wrote a letter to the Times, and I realized then I'd walked into a minefield But by 1967, Allegro's openness to other ideas had brought him in contact with the works of Professor Ramsbottom of London's Botanical Museum. Ramsbottom is likely the proper founder of the field of ethnomycology. Allegro also came across the works of R. Gordon Wasson, the famous amateur mycologist who is presently credited as the founder of this field of study. These people had suggested that the foundations of Hinduism and early Judaism were based on drug cults that used the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Allegro, based on his deep understanding of biblical lore, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and ancient history and language concluded that the foundations of Christianity could not be any different. I believe that the innocent collection of tales and sayings which was apparently allowed to pass freely among the beleaguered cells of believers in hourly danger of discovery and execution was but a cover story. From that highly improbable account of a gentle rabbi, friend of little children, Roman tax collectors and ladies with gynecological problems could be distilled by skilled interpreters 
well versed in the art of rabbinic exegesis as well as the abracadabra of Gnostic mysticism. Secret passwords and sayings. The formulae for medicaments and hallucinatory drugs. The therapia in practice and prescription which had earned them their reputation and name of Asaya Essenes physicians. By 1970, Allegro published what he considered the pinnacle of his research, a book he thought would launch him into history as one of the world's great thinkers, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. In this book, Allegro exposes the foundation of Christianity as not only a derivative of astrotheology, but he also exposes that much of the mythology paralleling Christianity is firmly rooted in fertility cults and psychedelic drug use especially that of the Amanita Muscaria. Throughout the rest of his life, Allegro published several books, including the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Christian Myth, that furthered his research into this area. However, the publication of The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, instead of launching Allegro as a famous thinker, destroyed his career. No scholar at the time would publicly debate Allegro on a point-by-point -point basis. They instead resorted to unfounded public attacks. However, Hindsight is 2020, and we, amongst many other researchers, think that Allegro, at least in large part, was correct. And some great thinkers are not recognized for their contributions until after their lives have ended. Allegro died on his 65th birthday, February 17, 1988. In May of 2005, John Allegro's daughter, Judith Ann Brown, published John Marco Allegro, The Maverick of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This book debunks most of the unfounded attacks against Allegro through the Allegro archives and his many missives. growth cycle of this mushroom is important to understand because our ancient ancestors who made these myths would watch this mushroom and see how it grew and those attributes were applied to a deity. So the growth cycle is very important to understand and just to run through this really quickly the mushroom begins as a spore. These spores are too small to be seen individually by the naked eye. We can see clusters of spores. But the spore is like the seed of the mushroom. And the part of the mushroom that we can see is the part of the mushroom used to spread the seed. It is the phallic portion of the mushroom. The actual body of the mushroom is the mycelium that is below the ground and attaching itself to the roots of the tree. So the mushroom attaches itself to the roots of the tree and it cannot live without this tree. These mushrooms live in a symbiotic, microizal symbiotic relationship with the tree and they help the tree, they feed the tree nutrients and the tree feeds them nutrients so they kind of live in harmony together. So these mushrooms are seen as the fruiting body of the tree. Just as nature needs a tree to grow apples nature also needs a tree to grow these mushrooms and just as an apple is something that is used by nature to spread a seed so is the mushroom so we see three stages of the mushrooms growth cycle here and the mushroom appears to be going through an egg stage a lot of mushrooms do this the amanita is one of them that appears to look like an egg in this stage of growth and it's white and on the right here you see the red cap of the mushroom peering through and what it is breaking through is called the universal veil so the universal veil tears to expose the red cap of the mushroom and it is a universal veil it covers the entire mushroom the universal veil covers the entire mushroom so as the veil tears as the red mushroom cap gets bigger and bigger the veil peels itself across the top of the mushroom and it leaves these remnants these veil remnants that leave white spots on the mushroom so now this is the male portion of the mushroom these stages of growth of the mushroom are considered male phallic as you 